Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome back to our show. We are Option Forward. I'm your boy, Drew. We're always joined by the second half of the show, GQ Nesto. How you doing today? What it do, what it do. I'm good. You sleep well? Definitely. You Definitely. know, I had my naps, you know, had had rejuvenated, you know what I mean? I'm good. All right, good. You want to fall asleep? No, I'm straight. All right, bet, bet. And ladies and gentlemen, we got a special guest today. Um, I would say in my personal opinion, that whole phrase of uh, think it, speak it, and execute, uh, we have a gentleman today who has created a platform that facilitates growth, education, and learning. Um, and I'm definitely interested in learning about his experience and, and what he's been through and his them, them teachable moments, them gems he want to drop. But uh, everybody, please welcome to the show, Mr. Courtney Wolfdruff. How are you doing today? What's up? Thanks for having me, man. How y'all doing? We good. We good. Doing good. How was traffic? Traffic was actually light for LA. It was it was it was smooth. It was for smooth. sure, it's a pretty day. It's a lot of cars on the road, but we used to it. For sure, for sure. Uh, for all the listeners who don't know anything about you, tell tell us a little bit about yourself. Where 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 did you grow up? Yeah, so I'm from uh, Mississippi, Jackson, to be exact. Uh, I'm an '80s baby. For sure. Um, and I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. Uh, we actually had a grocery store called Witch of Grocery. So, if you ever seen the movie The Help. My grandfather was the first and for a time the only black owner of a grocery store in Jackson. It was the grocery store that all the people during that time went to that was black. It was actually maybe two streets over from Meg Everett's house. Word. So um, country boy, grew up cutting grass, changing tires, uh, just doing a bunch of labor and shit. But um, <laughs> it, 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 oh, it may, it now, may no, no, no. I, I, honestly, I still do it. I'm going to chop some wood and make some fires and do all that. But um, I went to school, Alabama and m studied economics, fell in love with business, and um, just got really, really lucky with what I ended up being passionate about, which was business, finance, and technology. And um, what I left home when I was like 18, I'm about to be 35. So 17 years later, I'm in L.A. Most deaf, most deaf. Yeah. At, at what point did you realize like your your personal, maybe like even professional goals was going to outgrow Mississippi? Dang, man. You know what? I think this is going to go back to like how I was raised. But like the house I grew up in, we had maybe like four and a half, four acres of, of grass. And I didn't know it then, but like my dad was so hard on me. He's like, you're going to cut this grass every Friday. And I didn't realize that I was manifesting just daydreaming on the lawnmower for four or five hours, cutting it back and forth in the hot sun. But my dreams were just like always to be whatever I saw on TV, which was, and all I watched, if you even asked my mom to stay, was like Bloomberg, Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, Tom Keen at six in the morning, or it was soccer, which was like English Premier League. So I was getting accustomed to like life in Europe before I even like actually moved to Europe. Um, but with that being the case, if I wasn't watching TV, I was playing soccer, reading books about billionaires. And that's when I realized, like, I don't think there's only maybe one billionaire in Mississippi. And there's not any others. So I got to get out of Mississippi. And that literally was what it was. Seriously. So you grew up playing soccer? And I grew up playing soccer from probably the age of 3 to 22. Played Division One, college. Made a choice. Fell out of love with it and said business is going to be my new sport. And that's what happened. Yeah, I know you want to jump in on that. You just gonna dope. keep quiet what, on what, that. That's dope. Like, no, because position, man, pretty much midfield. <laughs> okay, know? yeah, midfield. But <laughs> you play long enough, you can understand every position except for goalie, because you know you gotta have certain physical attributes for that. But yeah, I, pl I play football. World Cup's coming up tomorrow who, who, too. Who's, who's, who's who is your team? Man, you know what? It's not even about team, but like I'm such a Cristiano Ronaldo fan. I would just it's the love. last. It's the last it's year. His last it's chance. Last right? year. No so more I really, Messi. No I really want to see all those guys. Just like I don't want to see anybody get crushed. But if Cristiano could like end his legacy or seal it with not only being at Manchester United but a World Cup, that would just be dope. What What's your final um, final matchup prediction for the World Cup? You know, I haven't even looked at the groups like that, so I don't want to be like. Two groups from the left side, but 
like if it goes the way I would say, I like I would love to see like either Portugal versus Argentina, yeah, um, or Portugal versus Brazil, just because yeah. like of the like the Portuguese, right? Um, and then like I guess they're like maybe Portugal and the United States, like you always got to represent for the home team. For sure, yeah. <laughs> That's dope. That's dope. Normally, whenever that's why I'm pointing to him. But normally, whenever you talk about soccer or whatever, he just jumps in because oh, he was a coach. Thing. That's his thing. You know what I'm saying? So it's a beautiful like, sport, like man. A Biggest sport in the world. Yeah, I, I coach soccer, and honestly, it was the most empowering opportunity ever. It just made me. Honestly, it 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 almost made me like understand a lot more about life than anything else. You know what I mean? I mean, it's the same for me. Like, I was very fortunate to, to my parents sacrificed and played club soccer and traveled the country. And as a young black kid, you know, in America, I think actually, shout out to CJSO, Central Jackson Soccer Organization. Our parents basically learned the game of soccer from this guy named Al Kamara in Jackson, Mississippi, who had moved here from Africa. And like, we all went to the same private school. And he was like, where's soccer at? So this guy back in like the early 90s was the first person to introduce soccer pretty much to the state of Mississippi. Wow. And taught all the parents and literally pretty much built a league and was coaching like all 10 teams at the same time. And then the parents caught on. And it was kind of crazy because as we ascended and got older, that's when like club kind of like formed probably like early 2000s. And that's how I was able to see a lot of the country traveling. And then from there it became, you know, we had like Brazilians coming over playing for our club. So then I grew up like speaking Portuguese because I was like best friends with Luan. And um, and soccer really like just exposed us being in the South to just how to like be around white people or how to like be on a soccer field and you're hearing like a team play against you speaking in only Spanish. And I just thought that was like the coolest thing being like 13 years old and the pitfalls of losing and like working hard at something. So, I mean, that's with with most sports, but soccer was one of those things where I was actually very blessed to have family and, and all my teammates' parents and they put us in vans every weekend and just took us around the country. That's you know? dope. Man. Yeah. That's but shout dope. out to CJSO. So, so like you, you were at I think you were at Alabama A and M. Yeah. Right? So yep. what was your? Uh, I know early on in your only career, cutting grass and doing the things. I know we <laughs> talked about you. Like, no, no, for real though. But I know because we talked, you know, prior to this, and yeah. I know like the the principles that your dad instilled yeah. into you. Yeah. So where I'm going with this this question is is like so what was your college experience like? Like did you realize? what your potential was at that point or like yo like this is just a part of the process yeah man you know what college was interesting for me because like i went to play soccer and school was like really easy and it was probably like around my sophomore year where i just remember the first week of school (laughs) the dean was like y'all are here to be adults you're going to learn how to communicate like adults Um, conduct yourself like adults and hopefully you like graduate and go into society and do blah 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 and um, I remember like going to school to be a cardiologist because I always wanted to be a cardiologist and there was like the first like zoology lab class and I was just like yo there is no way I'm doing this shit for eight years to make a million dollars like just no way and I took myself so serious in school like I went there to play soccer, but I wore suits to class every day. Like, I just knew I wanted to do business. And that was kind of like a, a unheard of thing on an HBCU campus, unless you were like a noob or alpha. And like, mm-hmm. it was a certain day and y'all had like something going on. Like suit then, day. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but like, you ain't, you ain't coming into like a HBCU campus as a freshman wearing no suit, you know, talking about business and economics and shit, right? Uh, but like, maybe sophomore year, I remember going to like all my professors and like reciting the speech that the dean gave us freshman year. And be like, hey, they say we gotta communicate like adults, so this is me. I got the syllabus. I'm about to do everything on the syllabus in the next 10 days. If I get that to you, this is my logic. I'm one less student you gotta worry about in class. Can I just be allowed to come take the midterm and the final? And they said, yes. So my last two years of college, I did that, and I just really went on campus. If I didn't want to be, I traveled. Damn, bro. <laughs> Ten days, though? Yeah, man. School was, like, really easy for me, honestly. 
Where do you think that comes from? No Adderall, no Limitless pill, no nothing. <laughs> like, like, come on, like, oh, for real. Man. Like, all pure? I'm all them distractions shit. out there, Courtney? Come <laughs> on, bro. I, I was partying a lot, but it's just sit down and focus, man. It's just, just a syllabus. Like, you know what you got to do. Just do it, you know? Uh, and, like, I, monkey notes? I, I will say <laughs> I was blessed. Like, I had a full scholarship, so I wasn't stressed about sending money back home to my parents or... None of that, which is like a lot of my peers, you know, had to do. Um, but I think also because I had these internships every summer and I went to the East Coast, I went to the West Coast, I just saw what life was like. I wasn't in the summer just going home to fuck off and just chill and bullshit. Like I was. You were not trying to come back, huh? <laughs> I was reading books. I was reading the Wall Street Journal. I was getting to know myself. I was making a plan. Like, so if I just been on a in an asset management firm or whatever, right? And I'm, I just saw how the staff reacted to this 2008 financial crisis. I'm getting a chance to talk to billionaires and executives about all this. I mean, like, I'm not about to sit in class for, for you know, 30 weeks out of the year talking about like economics 101. It's just like I just saw it firsthand. So it was just easy for me, you know. Do you, do you think it was like your upbringing that kind of made you that way? It was my upbringing. It was like what I was interested in in my spare time too. Like I'm a nerd. Like I'm chill, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm a nerd, man. Like in my spare time, I'm either watching <laughs> documentaries or reading books or or just hanging out with my friends. But I read a lot. I watch a lot, and I really try to like study super successful people. Um, and just like correlate like what happened last time like we had inflation like we had right now patterns like, where's, like pattern matching right that stuff just is interesting to me so so, so like we were actually talking about that earlier um because because i was telling him about that and i, I brought it up in the, in the previous episode but it, it, it's mind-blowing because what our brains can do like first of all we we don't rely on motivation we rely on our on emotion right mm -hmm. and there's like about six thousand emotions that you can kind of channel to and sometimes they're there some are good some are bad but the end game is it's like learning how to catch the patterns utilizing those patterns and then creating your own pattern yeah so like do you think that it was it was all because of like Fuck! I'm not coming back here. Like, you know what? I'm about to. I'm about to be very successful. Like, were you analyzing those things? Like, just seeing your surrounding and then seeing the opportunities out there and just kind of putting everything together. Yeah, it was a little bit of that, and it was just like seeing stuff happening, like kind of having an eye to to realize what was happening as it was happening. Like, for example, in 2008, I remember calling my dad and working. I was working for this really big bank for the summer. And I was like, yo, they're paying us all this money and they have like all these corporate events. It just it just feels real excessive. Like I don't <laughs> I don't get it, right? And I was like, I know we like kinda of on Wall Street, but this is like nuts. And it was like maybe I think oil had hit hundred and sixty six dollars a a barrel. And I and that's when you start seeing people like complaining about gas prices and feeling the pinch, right? And it was probably like three months after that Lehman Brothers collapsed. Mm -hmm. And then like Obama had just got like inaugurated and he had to come in with the bailout and all that stuff, right? The point of the story was talking back to some of the executives at the bank. They were like, yeah, a lot of the executives knew the good times were over. So they were trying to keep employee morale up. And just like have all these events, and because they they knew what was happening, but a lot of the employees didn't. So in my mind, I was like, "Damn, I wasn't crazy," because I was like, "Yo, something is off here." You know what I'm saying? So like when when little small things like that happen over and over again, you can predict it. Like like right now, we're getting ready to go into this like recession or whatever. But the crazy put put, put, put some game on that, because I I want to pick your brain on that, because like my input based on what I see and I, I'm in the you know lending industry and I see it as a way of like you know let me let me um, like it's almost as 2008 but not to that degree you know I feel like it's gonna be more of a, more of a of a let me let me reset it real quick at least 10 20 percent not like 2008 of course but what, what's your thought on that I mean, it's just like, where do you start? I mean, a lot of it has to do with 
the fiscal and monetary policy that's came from like the Fed or the White House and I mean arguably like Joe Biden well Trump kind of started with like a lot of the stimulus or whatever but then when you look at the control of the House and the Senate uh, the the Senate race in Georgia last not this this previous one but the last one that was like really really close it actually you know whether you're Democratic or Republican you can see where the Democrats had control of the House and there were basically a lot of fiscal stimulus that has kind of led to um, the inflation that we have right now. And there's argument that if there had been a little bit more contention, that wouldn't have happened because ultimately I think we added $10 trillion worth of debt mm. to the country's um, debt load in just the last two years. Um, so, you know, you have the Fed trying to taper inflation. You have this upcoming presidential election. Obviously, we just figured out who's controlling the Senate and the House right now. But a lot of it do have to um, be traced back to monetary and fiscal policy and what's happened over the last four years. But, I mean, the good times are kind of over right now. So there, to your quest, to answer your question, there is kind of a reset um, in the capital markets. Uh, you got to look at what's going on also from a geopolitical geopol- standpoint. Um, are the Saudis going to be really, really hard on us and and basically taper off and you know be more friendly to Russia and China right now? And then are we going to actually go against our green energy policies and become energy efficient against the world, which basically ha- makes us like push back you know the energy um, friendly programs that Obama kind of enacted over the last 20 years to basically wean ourselves off of the rest of the world. So there's just like so many things. But, but let, let's <laughs> let's pick the part where we can monetize on that. Like, well, the best was, companies, you know, like the, come about during these times. Airbnb literally came about in 2008, you know. So it's just it's a reset. You know, you have layoffs and things. But then what happens is amazing entrepreneurs create dope companies and you have all this talent out there that you're going to be able to basically pick and hire like 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 that dude uh elon the way he came in on twitter yeah gangster (laughs) he came in gangster (laughs) yeah me and my friends got a bet right now uh i got a friend cedric he he uh he's the ceo of all deaf and we um we got a bet i don't think twitter's going anywhere he does i'm like dude as long as people are tweeting about twitter how could it it's like when yeah. Mark Zuckerberg created the uh, the wall, and there was like all this backlash about the news feed, not the wall, the news feed. But it's like people were posting it on the news feed, and that's how he knew to ignore like a hundred million people complaining because you're literally using the product the way I envision you to use it. Well, just recently, I think we hit <laughs> what Wednesday it came out eight billion. Yeah, population. It's the regular, yeah, it's crazy. population. So why I'm worried about a hundred million, eight billion. And then we're not even talking about who has access right. to the platform. So why, why am I even tripping? But, man, y'all getting all political, bro. Like, look, listen. All right, listen. <laughs> so, so after after Alabama, um, yeah. you studied abroad, right? Where yeah, yeah. I, I, so I went to Barcelona, Spain. I went to a school called um, IESC. It was crazy. So when I graduated a and um, like I've always wanted to go to Harvard Business School. And typically you probably apply when you're like 28. 27, 28, 29. And um, I went home for maybe like seven months. And I was like, all right, I got to get out. I'm not staying in Mississippi. I'm going to go to either Harvard for the summer just to see if they have like a trial program to see what it would be like. The top five business schools. So I think it was like ESA, which is the school in Spain. Harvard didn't have one. Chicago Booth, Yale, and Princeton. It was like super expensive, just like a five-day tour basically to see what it would be like. Okay. And... Um, I went, but I was so like hungry to get out of Mississippi. And once again, like I'm walking around with like a suit on going to class every day that they literally pulled me aside and was like, do you want to like apply for the <laughs> the real full time program? And I was like, apply when? They were like tomorrow. And I was just like, all right, cool. Um, a little nervous considering like I'm 21 and most people prepare for those type of interviews for like months. Right. Um, and I did it. And probably the next day, one of the admins of the school walked by because it was the last day of the program. I was getting ready to fly back to the States. 
And she was like, yo, congratulations. Welcome to the class of 2013. Um, you need to be back in Spain in 10 days. And I was just like, oh, shit, you know? Um, and that's like, like the first time like something like super big happened in my life where you you have this dream in Mississippi and then you look up and you're in the number one business school in the world without applying technically. But then it was like crazy when I got there because I still, then I was like, well, you got to take the GMAT just officially. So now I'm like, I don't want to have this horrible score when these people just let me in. But now I have 48 hours to like study for the GMAT. I think I ended up making like a 740 on it though. Um, but it was just like, that was like probably one of the hardest periods of my life going to Spain because you're like young. I don't know anybody that's going to HBS or ESA. So ESA is Harvard Sister School. It's like something weird in the charter where the licensing, they can't technically call it HBS, but it's like the Catholic Church or something has a charter and they have the permission to open up a school. So they opened one up in Spain. And what they did was they made it a requirement that any professor at the school had to have gotten their PhD from that school or Harvard. So our school would write Harvard's case studies, which is the case study method where you like read about a company, whether it be from a marketing perspective, a marketing class, a finance class, whatever. And then that's pretty much what everyday lecture is about, the daily lectures. So um, our case studies would either be from HBS directly or from our professors. And I think because the sentiment in Spain is like siestas and things, they really took it like serious that like we have the honor of having HBS charter, you know, associated with us. So they worked us like, it was crazy, man. I, I, I still talk to friends that went to like HBS in, um, in Cambridge and Boston. And like, no, it wasn't, this, it wasn't this crazy, man. Like, that was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. So what was the, like, what was the adjustment like, though? We're talking about Mississippi, though. Yeah, it was hard. Spain, you know, right? like, like, A, no social life because, you know, you don't speak the language initially. Um, you're the youngest person. You're the only black person. Um, what else? You had no time to prepare. You have no mentors that have been there, done that before. So you're very much on your own, right? Um, you, you don't understand like necessarily what all you want to get out of uh, business school. Like I went literally to learn. I didn't go to figure out how to politic and blah blah blah. I'm not. I'm not thinking about the fact that my classmate is one of the princes of Saudi Arabia or this person's dad is the wealthiest person in Europe. And this is like all the reasons why people prepare to go to this school, which by the way is normally like a decade long process for people. I'm just grateful to be there and I'm just minding my business and I'm trying to learn. Um, but I also was like trying to start a company at the time and it just like really started conflicting with like school and what I was passionate about. And the craziest thing though was like, I went from going from undergrad with no debt to like $100,000 worth of debt because that's what it was costing a year to go to the school for two, like it's two years, a hundred grand each year. Um, but I just like figured out what I was passionate about and after the craziness of trying to figure out how to get to Spain back and back to Spain in ten days and pay this tuition and find an apartment and I think the euro at the time was like a dollar and sixty cents it was like so expensive um, I dropped out after the first year because I wanted to start a company. So was there any? Do you think like thinking back like I always I look at things like I look at things differently than other people like so. I always feel like it's like an inclusion like type thing. Like somebody in the boardroom, they're like, I'm looking at the campus, Joe. Why we don't got no black people on campus? You know what I'm saying? So they're yeah. like, all right, well, <laughs> let's go out and find one. Hey, wh what were we looking for? Hey, look for somebody with a suit. You know, brothers don't wear no suits, right? And then here you go, they see you walking around campus <laughs> in the suit. Hey, hey, Joe, I got him, I got him. And, you know, so yeah. was there any added pressure, like, yo, not only do you got to represent for yourself, but, like, did you feel like you fit, in, fit into that category of, like, yo, man, I got to perform because they normally don't give people who look like me this yeah, opportunity. Yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a lot of pressure, like, on me. I, I, remember, I remember one day going to, the like, the dean or something and going, yo, the campus photographer is, like, my fucking best friend. Every time I turn around, he's on me. Like, I don't want to be on every brochure. I don't, like, I just want to, like, be here and figure out my vibe. If I want to make friends, I want to make friends. But I don't, I don't want to be a shadow. I don't want to be, like, yo, the face of diversity 
for the school, you know? That's kind of wrong. <laughs> I mean, kind of, right? right? It's like exploitive, <laughs> right? Um, and then the other You're thing is monetized. like... monetized. <laughs> yeah, and like living in like Barcelona, you know, oftentimes like when I would go to the airport or whatever and you show like your um, your ID or whatever and they realized what school you and they were like so surprised because there really weren't a lot of black people in Barcelona at the time. It was like a few like semi ball players, semi-pro ball players. But then other than that, it was like very poor African immigrants. And so people are not even used to you like walking up and down the street, um, like just looking polished, you know? Not not unfriendly to you, that's not what I'm saying, but you just definitely felt like all eyes were always on you. And that was just like something that, I mean, you kind of used to it when you're in like certain rooms, but this was a little different because there was just like so much pressure on me like uh, academically. So, um, to perform you should have never finished the, the test early man like, <laughs> you drew a lot of attention to yourself like I mean, that's, man, that's it was crazy. tough it was real that's tough crazy i know when we we spoke on the phone like I, I you know what i'm saying i told you you was like bro you need a second call and i'm like no nah, no nah, i think i got enough from from what i'm trying to what i'm trying to produce here but like you you emphasize on the importance of your internship right not right. only on your professional life but like your personal development you want to highlight on or expound on that yeah I mean like for me I think just access and, and exposure and just just seeing people and how they carry themselves and seeing them being a place that you want to be was just like always important to me and just also realizing like there's a phrase you don't know what you don't know so like when I went to business school Everybody was like so amazed, like, how did you get here? Like, you're only 21 and you didn't apply. But a lot of my friends that were foreign were like, listen, literally when I was 10 years old, my mom and dad made the decision to send us off to the United States to a friend that they met in college that lived in the States so we could learn English. And then we would go there for two years to come back to our home country so we can get into the most prestigious private school from, you know, for high school. That high school would then let us be able to go to the best schools in Europe or the United States. And then those schools would let us get the right internships to get the right jobs, to have the right bosses and the right brand to then write me a letter of recommendation just to come back to this school. And when you start to see like how methodical the people that are really like in the C-suites of companies and the people that are like in politics and making all these decisions, how methodical it is for, for their parents to get them to where they are, you realize like, holy shit, we don't have a chance. Like, this is like well thought out and designed and this is very purposeful and intentional, you know? Um, so that's like one lesson. And then you start seeing stuff like that on various internships where there's like, you get a chance to travel abroad or you're getting a chance to like make all this money. One of my biggest things was like having those internships and then not being able to get jobs. Mm. after I graduated and realizing, oh, this is kind of like Title IX. Like, oh, you just once again needed to be like, oh, we gave a group of black students an internship for the summer, take a photo, put it in the Wall Street Journal. But now I can't, I can't even get a job to make as much money as you were paying me to do nothing as an intern. Damn. And Check, that was crazy too. That's wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah, mean, yeah. but that was the reality. I think that's kind of what also drove me to uh, entrepreneurship. I was like, there is no way. I want to like waste, not waste, but spend my time personally like playing this game. I rather try to create something that scales and help people. Most definitely. Speaking of that, right? I know you spent time in some uh, Silicon Valley. Yeah. Right. So, what was the inspiration behind that move? Yeah. So, I think like when I was in Europe, I I dropped out because I had a company that I was trying to start, which was was basically like a platform that was going to help people connect with personal trainers, and. Um, I was working for this company after I dropped out and, and someone just told me, dude, just go. So I like I had maybe I had enough money for a plane ticket and I think maybe like ten days worth of hotel fare. And I just went to San Francisco. I didn't know anybody, literally, and I was like, I'm not gonna stay in a hotel and be by myself. So what I'll do, I went to Airbnb and found a hostel for startup founders. And I was like, Well, if I only have ten days Worst case, I just go work at Starbucks or something, but at least I have 10 days to network with like-minded people. And I think I went there and I met some dope entrepreneurs. And from there, I think I went to the owner of the hostel who had like two bunk beds in a room, literally. I was like, holy shit, San Francisco is expensive because even that, like a bunk bed was like mm -hmm. maybe, a bunk bed for like four days probably was like my whole budget. 
I was like, hey guys, if I write you a business plan and increase your occupancy, can I get like a month for free? And they were like, yeah. And so I did it. And I really went to Silicon Valley because I wanted to like understand investment. I wanted to understand how to build an app, how to recruit, how to talk to venture capitalists, how to talk to angel investors, just like the entire ecosystem of building a tech company specifically, how to pitch, how to do all that stuff. And I felt like you're not gonna learn that just reading about it around the world. You gotta like take the leap and you have to immerse yourself in it. And because there was so much pressure on me, I had no choice but to try to learn as fast as possible. And it's not something that you can really learn overnight, but no. certain moments and doors open up for you. And that's kind of what started happening for me. Like I met this one guy in the hostel. It was like, hey, I'm in San Jose. It's a little bit further south, but it's a lot cheaper than San Francisco. If you ever come down there, check it out. And if anybody live in the Bay, you know, like the city is expensive and you start going further and further south, depending on your bank account. So I went from like San Francisco to then a, a startup house in Atherton, which was like, I didn't really even realize how expensive Palo Alto and Atherton is. Cause that's like where all the, the VCs live, but it was just a startup house, right? Um, and then I ultimately went to San Jose and he was like, yo, you know, you said you wanted to create this platform where people could find like personal trainers for all sports. He's like, I saw this former retired uh, San Francisco 49er homeless and I thought about your platform. He's like, I know you were going to pay to stay here, but just give me 1.66% equity in your company. That's my lucky number. And you can have my garage as long as you want. So like I had an air mattress, a hookah and my laptop. You said a hookah. Yeah. <laughs> if you know me, I'm going I'm, I'm to smoke hookah every day. That's just what I do. Um, this is real. No, no, I, no, I know. No, I get and, it. I get and it. Actually, I've been I telling just, people that's probably like why I'm so connected to hookah to this day because like when I was homeless, basically, uh, that was like my, my comfort, literally. And I built the first company, which was called Trainer's Vault, in his garage. And what I would do is uh, my best friend, CJ in Bermuda, like, he was like one of my first investors and my co-founder now, Averell, in the new company. And they maybe gave me like 10 grand and my uncle and my aunt and a few people. Um, and I would take the mega bus to LA once a week to network with trainers. And then once once we built the website and I had been up there for like 18 months, we moved to LA because I thought it would be easier to like network with trainers and build the brand and we launched that company. Um, and so it, it's kind of funny because it basically was OnlyFans for fitness before OnlyFans even came out. It's just right. subscription and stuff had not really like emerged. But in my mind, I was like looking at one of my, my business partners now, Cortez Bryant, who was like the CEO of Young Money at Managed Wayne and Nikki and Discovered Drake. And I was just watching him build artists. And it was just like, I would pick his brand like, okay, you got this concert, but then you got like this this podcast, and then you got the merch line, and he was just doing all these dope things for, for all the artists. And once again, like I wanted to be in tech, but going back to Access, the only person that I knew that looked like me that had kind of like did business at a level that I wanted to, to do it on, that was even around me in Jackson, Mississippi was him. So I was just trying to learn as much as I could from him, someone that's in music, totally different right, from right, technology, right. right? But applied to what I was doing. So I was like, you know what? Instagram, social media, personal trainers, they're brands. Like y'all can have classes in the park, but you can also create videos and have them stream into people around the world. And then you could do your merch. And so we basically built software to help them manage all of that stuff. And I personally thought being from the South that the black trainers were the ones that didn't really understand like LA and media and filming it. By the way, this was like eight years ago, not in the world of now, like TikTok and Snapchat do, do and blah, think, blah, blah. Do you think like COVID kind of helped you, especially in that platform? You know the irony of that platform? I literally began to wound it down right before COVID. Mm. And it was just like a long seven year Blessing, journey for sure. where we had it was just like so hard building that company, like raising money, it was like impossible. I was like spending half my time going to Asia, which is where I was actually finally getting investors. Um, it wasn't happening in the United States. I think just being a first time, very young black entrepreneur that wasn't perfect by any means, not as polished as I am now, but was making like really, really good money. Like we had probably like close to a million customers. Um, 
put millions of dollars of, of, of money in a lot of personal trainers' pockets. But I was just like so burnt out. I remember like right before COVID, I came up with the idea for something I thought would be like a little bit more impactful. And I, re- I really began to like wind that, co- wind that company down. And a lot of times people would be like, dang, like yeah, you just stuck in it for like another year. Like it would have like took off again, but you have to kind of like look at things for what they are. And like for me, I like I learned so many lessons over the course of like running that company for seven years that it actually helped me build a new company and get more done in like the first 12 months than with the new company than I probably did seven years with the old company. Well, rule of thumb is after three years, take it to the back of the barn. Take it down. And to do what? Not a shark. Yeah. <laughs> but not, I, you know what? Like, with, with, but with technology companies, it's norm. It normally takes. You know, it could take easily seven, seven years to a decade. Honestly, and that's that's the misconception. Like a lot of people think, like, oh, I'm just gonna build this app and it's gonna take off, take off overnight. A as an entrepreneur. If you if you haven't had an exit and you've done this before, it's definitely going to take you a long time. Um, and B, you it's so much you have to learn, like building a tech company. Like it's so much, and it's not just around the app or how to get customers. It's around the the finance and raising the capital, the legal structure, setting it up to either be acquired or to take it public. Um, the recruitment, like there is a certain language that you need to speak to the various departments within the company. There's just like so many things. It's actually impossible for it to happen overnight. It it, it literally is evolving as as you grow, right? Like it's, yeah. it's basically just changing day by day. Like think about like how the 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 only problem right now is that yeah, there is a lot of information out there through all these you know um, different types of access, but. The, the question is, is what do you do with the information? Like the information is there, but what are you going to do with it? And I think that that's the part where um, a lot of people out there are pretty like on some other shit, you know? <laughs> well, no, because it's, I believe is that, that execution phase, you know what I'm saying? Cause like you can go, you can Google like how to start a business or how to do this or how to do that. And YouTube, the remember? basic information is there, but like you said, it's them intangibles that you don't see, you know what I'm saying? The language that you got to speak, man. Cause I can relate, but anyway, bro, yeah. I, I I can relate. I know it's it's been it's been challenging for 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 us, you know what I'm saying. But we're still trying to learn that language, you know what I'm saying. So it, it just goes more into, hey, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna, I'm gonna improve something about this, and I'm gonna put this product out there and then everybody gonna want it. But you can have an amazing product, but if you don't have the right tools behind you, your product is not even gonna be seen. Because but, it's not be it's not even put in, in front of the in front of the right people. You know what I'm saying? Like you gotta have like you so they say, right? So let's just go off topic, like let's talk about music, right? Okay. So we always say, Oh man, this music that they putting out here today is just trash. Okay. Like this yeah. is trash, right? But it's the it's the machine behind that artist, right? They 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 look at the demographic, they look at what people are, are, are liking and they push that. Absolutely. Right? Because you got to take it back in the day, Bahamadias, you know what I'm saying? Erica Badu's, you know what I'm saying? You mm-hmm. got them artists like that even till today, right? The Rhapsodies, right? You got them Rhapsody, today, by the way. right? And and they don't get the exposure. Right. Why right. do you think? Because, bro, like, if you want the exposure, you got to put money behind your product, and which leads me to my next question. <laughs> Let's talk about raising this capital because I know you had challenges with that, right? Because you need the capital to put your stuff out there. If nobody want to invest in you, bro, if ain't nobody believing in what you're talking about, like, bro, like, no, nah, it, it's just not happening. Right. So, what what challenges did you face, or what obstacles? Like, how did you how did you manage that? Look, so I rephrase it: What challenges am I facing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's never easy, you know what I'm saying? Um, I'm trying to think. Besides friends and family, it probably took me. Five years to like actually raise money from a a real venture capital firm, um, and then I got a few offers. But me being me, it's like I don't I don't I don't like how y'all operate. No, it's like like when you turn down that million dollars and but you got like two bucks negative twenty in your bank account. <laughs> like I've had the moments too. 
But it's like, and then like news come out ultimately of these investors, these funds, like three years later when everybody like, you should have did it. It's like, I told you, I didn't feel it. You know, I, I didn't see how these guys operate, but the challenges, man, I mean, so like the first challenge is like, you're young, you're black, you don't get a chance to not be perfect. You don't get a chance not to articulate yourself the perfect way and not use the right vernacular and not set the conversation up and say certain things where people know you know what you're talking about. Like if I was like Zuckerberg coming from Harvard, I go like, I don't know what that is. They're like, oh, well, you're smart. We're going to help you figure it out and we're going to give you the money to buy the time. Not to mention, he's like, yeah, and my parents put in half a million dollars already, so I don't really need it, you know? Mm-hmm. Right, so right. so you have that and then you have the I have the uh the the challenge and the the biggest problem I have is like dealing with the investors that look like us mm-hmm. that you look up to and you work hard to like meet and you hear what they say and you you see what they say they're going to do and then when you meet them behind closed doors they're the total opposite and you feel like you wasted all this time and it becomes very demoralizing because you're going like fuck if you know the system that actually exists isn't really like giving me the benefit of the doubt and then the people that look like me aren't really fucking with me because it don't make them look cooler than they already are or it's not beneficial to them like where do I turn mm-hmm. in my case I got lucky and went to Asia and it was the first time I felt embraced because to be honest, like I got used to like the prejudices of traditional white led venture capital firms in Silicon Valley or whatever, right? And you have those moments where you're like really disrespected. I mean like people are like assholes in meetings and face to face. But then like for me it was like some of the black venture capitalists were even worse. And it's like, man, I got my own line and my pledging. Like, what is going on? Like, like help me. Like, I, I'm, I'm making money. Like, you know, and then you start figuring out what it's about. It's more of a PR game. And like, once they say they invested in you and who's associated with it, and you just start to figure out all these things. But so like, those were like the biggest challenges, right? And it comes to like, really like studying the game. Like, for example, we all know what the word cap mean, right? Mm-hmm. But how many of us know what a cap table is? You got me. Bro. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, like, that's something very, very easy. Like, that's the first thing an investor is going to say. Let me see the cap table. And it's funny because in Jay Z's in that new verse on um, on uh, Khaled's album, he talks about a cap table. And it was just like kind of funny because I was like, that probably went over a lot of people's heads. But these are like, if you're going to be in tech and you're going to be talking about angel investors and venture capitalists and all this stuff. You got to like literally make a list of the vocabulary and understand what's needed. And then we also got to share this information. Like I'll go to a venture capitalist now and I will I will like set the tone and be like, ask them who they LPs are, their limited partners. Who did you get your money from? Like you got to understand like the pressure on them and let them know that you understand what they need before you go to them talking about what you need. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It's like if you got a if you got a memorandum on you that you need to make a million dollars this year and I need your investment. I need to tell you, I know you need to make a million dollars this year and I got a plan to help you do it as opposed to I'm broke, I'm poor, I got an idea, can you give me some money? It's just not gonna happen. And it's just like subtle ways you can do that and just like things, like I always like, fuck, I spend so much money with lawyers, I will give like term sheets, mark out the confidential information because these are the cheat codes that everybody else do that we don't do, right? You know what? Here go twenty thousand dollars worth of documents. You talking to this investor? I work with them already. There is no way they're gonna redline it, install you out, and be like, go back and forth. I'm telling you, cause cause I already paid to negotiate and have these 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 like documents like redline. Here's the template of the convertible note or the safe or the the transaction, et cetera, et cetera. Done. Save you like a week of stress and time. You know. And when you start getting like help and stuff like that. You can make you can make life for yourself a lot easier and for other people because there's always going to be obstacles but it's all about like trying to like prevent them before they come up he hits them with the spreadsheet <laughs> I mean, yeah you get hit with the spreadsheet you the better know sheet, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you better know how to respond <clears throat> yeah i mean the that's sheet. what's up yeah that's what dope. what i found uh most interesting about about like you know what i'm saying learning about you and, and speaking with you is, is that whole stem thing you know what I'm saying? And yeah. 
in your in your opinion, do you feel like there should be more of an emphasis in, in our community? You know what I'm saying? As far as, you know, we put the emphasis on the ap- athletes, right? But mm-hmm. what about that person who chose that STEM uh, related career path? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Should we highlight them like we do the athletes? Absolutely. I mean, like, so the the new company is Assemble, you know, which is it's a platform that literally highlights black and brown experts across all business sectors around the world. Um, and we film master classes with them or give you a way to interact and get mentorship from them. Um, and it's for an audience like us that is going to easily relate or better relate to black and brown successful people and that was kind of the whole reason why we created it because i felt like there was way too much emphasis on the entertainers and the athletes as opposed to just the infrastructure around the athlete like okay there's a drake or there's a wayne but who's around him like what is the machine around him how many jobs how many people do they employ right um and whether it be STEM, whether it be landscape or just barbershop, like how do I sh- how do I highlight somebody that's made a million dollars cutting hair and help a kid go, you know what, I can take $25, I can go to Walmart, I can get a pair of clippers and I can be on my way and I can have this same lifestyle, you know? Yeah. Um, so absolutely, and like what we wanted to do initially as we were filming and we started filming these classes was we spent a lot of money to make sure that we kind of gave everybody their flowers and we made them look just as good as we would have made an athlete or an entertainer look because everybody's not literally physically capable of being an athlete or an entertainer like god just then bless us all to be able to like <laughs> drop bars or sing or you're a good reader or hoop. <laughs> but if that's the only thing you see on tv that's the only thing you're going to glorify and it's nothing wrong with that when you start thinking about like time and opportunity cost and how much time is getting wasted, how much energy. It's like like one of the craziest things for me is when I see like young black boys learn for the first time how to be like disciplined and motivated by like something and it actually be sports and they they literally give it their all, right? And no one ever takes enough time to go, just in case you don't make it D1. Just in case you don't make it D1, which is already hard. And if you do play for a big Division One school, like the op- the chances of you going to the NFL is even slimmer, right? And then you only have a three-year career. So, like, psychologically preparing these kids for, like, if it don't work out. Because it's, like, the first time they're, like, I gave it my all and I failed. And a lot of people don't recover from that. So how do we just like give people, you know, a thousand more options that look just as cool as a dude on the sidelines with a helmet on Monday Night Football and be like, you can make as much money as well, you know? So that's kind of like the whole point of creating the the tech company. I think, I think that's difficult for a lot of people who like, you identify your, your passions and what you're passionate about at some point in your life. And then I think most of us, especially us sitting in this room and at this table, like when you go all out on something, man, and the result, the end result is not what you expect it to be. Like that's that's just a tough pill to swallow. Yeah. And, you know, we just talking about athletics. But I, I, I mean, I totally agree that it's super important uh, to push like that education aspect. Right. Because most of the times you hear about these these entertainers. Uh, going broke, you know what I'm saying? But like, you got a dude in Silicon Valley rolling a Tesla that he he's straight. You know what I'm saying? He gonna be straight for a minute because <laughs> yeah. he develops him. While you out there practicing in the field, he on a computer learning how to code. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. it's just, I just think in in our community, man, I, I I think maybe there's a little bit of a shift now. You know what I'm saying? Because like you said, like we're not we're not all born to be athletes or singers right. or like that. But you know, we all have this. Right. You know what I'm saying? And that's that's God given, bro. And whatever you take that you can just but just know there's a backup to a backup, I think is super important. Yeah, and like the backups are actually cool. I mean, I I think I say this all the time. I think one of the biggest curses that we have is is celebrities. And the <laughs> irony is people 
take away the wrong lessons when they see celebrities. Like, they take away the fame and the perceived fortune and the fact that they're being idolized. Like, what you should take away is, like, at one point, this person was very normal. Because unless you're, like, royalty, you're just, you're born normal. Like, you're not a celebrity, even if you're wealthy. Like, you're not on TMZ every day, right? (laughs) So here's a person, and prior to, like, you know, online influencers or whatever, um, that was just normal. But there's something in them that it, that gives them a talent that makes large entities with money to spend share it with them. And then they just so happen to be famous. Like that's the that's the after effect. And all the bullshit comes along with it, good and bad, right? But like go down to the core of that person. And the core of that person is I'm normal. Life has taken me like all the way to the moon. But, like, I had to have confidence in myself. Like, it was like, you know what I'm saying? Like, Jackson 5, Gary and Diana, who would have thought it? And I think people, like, forget that. They think, like, unless I was, like, already born in L.A. or whatever, I can't do it. No, like, you can do it. And, like, that's, like, one of my biggest things, just normalizing success. Like, we all should be as confident as Kanye West or whoever it may be. And just because you're confident and successful also don't mean you need to be famous. That's that's the that's the other thing, right? To your point, I got a lot of Silicon Valley friends, billionaires, created all the fucking apps that we use to this day. And the beauty of them is they can walk outside right now and nobody know who they are. So they're safe, they sound, and they can hit one button and make us all be like scratching our head going to Twitter right now complaining because something ain't working. Exactly. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but now, nah, but like speaking of that, like right. So I know, it, I I would only imagine like, what it, what does it look like as far as developing your app to going into the boardrooms and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Are there a lot of people in those spaces that look like us at this table? Never. <laughs> so how <laughs> so how important is pushing that like diversity and representation? in this type of career view. You know, it's interesting. It's very important to have the representation, but then I think we also, like, as a community, got to check ourselves, because, like, all kinfolk ain't kinfolk, you know? Uh, And, like, a lot of us be on bullshit. Like, we look around and be like, oh, I'm here, I'm different. And we don't Mm. reach back. And so I just, like, want the culture to be, like, very, very, like, cognizant of, yeah, we definitely need diversity but we also need to then like hold people accountable when they get the benefit of being like brown skin or dark skin and getting in those rooms because bro if you're not reaching back why we waste our like not even going into politics but why we waste our support championing you just for you to like be at the top of the pyramid saying look at me but you're not reaching back you know for sure um because that's that's oftentimes what happened and then everything just kind of turns into like you know this political game all over again across all business sectors it turns into like a who you know who you know who you know and fuck man if i'm from mississippi i'm i might not just know nobody i just might not and that's not my fault but that don't mean that i don't have the chance to create bet like bob johnson did or become mm-hmm. oprah renfrey dang that's tight bro <laughs> so, like, when you think about it, like, do you think, uh, well, what can we do? All right, because I, I know this is, like, like super obvious, like, in, at least in my opinion, from, from my standpoint of this whole independence thing, right? So, I got this idea. I got this invention. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to do things differently, but I can't get no support. So, I go out on my own. I'm independent. I'm making things happen. You know what I'm saying? And once I get to this level of success... Now everybody want to jump on a wagon wheel. Like, yo, 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 I got you. Why do you think there's such a delayed uh, kind of like support system within our community when we, you know what I'm saying, we're trying to do something different, right. bro? I think because we don't look at things in the in the terms of like a framework and putting systems in place um, to like maintain success. So that might sound a little convoluted, but I, I'll give you an example There was this guy named Paul Graham, and in 2002, he like sold a he sold his tech company for maybe like 40 million dollars. And he he and his wife decided like once a week we're gonna invite entrepreneurs 
to our um, house and we're just going to mentor them or whatever. And then when they start to see like how many people are coming, they say, you know what? We're going to probably invest like fifteen to twenty thousand dollars in each person. And we're this is a white guy, by the way. And we're also going <laughs> to um, we're going to call our friends that have had successful tech companies or lawyers or whatever. And they're going to come over and eat and, and mentor. Um, that thing turned into what's called Y Combinator, which is like the Harvard of accelerators. So an accelerator is normally like a three month um, program where entrepreneurs can apply and they can pretty much go sit in once a week or once a day, have office space, get mentorship and get investment. And then like these programs bring in speakers and mentors. And then at the end of like graduation, they bring in a lot of investors and they prepare you to pitch. So it's kind of like Shark Tank, but it's like yeah, yeah. three months of intensive, like we here to help you and we're going to give you a little money, but we're also going to like mentor you, right? The point of that story is that was started in 2002 and it has grown into probably 10,000 companies have applied to be a part of it. And I think they have like over 2,000 companies and the combined value of the companies they've invested in by the way they have seven percent ownership mm -hmm. and they started out with twenty thousand dollar checks and then went to fifty a hundred now it's like a quarter of a million but the combined value of the companies are a trillion dollars and just to name the companies that were started inside of Y Combinator Airbnb Stripe um, what else uh, what's the DoorDash um, Coinbase and Dropbox Reddit so many companies now if you have 10,000 companies trying to apply for this that means that there is a system they've built a system go online fill out these questions they have a committee they read the answers then they select a hundred and fly you out to Mountain View do the interview and if you get accepted they they take like a batch of 20 companies I think it got up to like a hundred but they literally kept saying like how do we find the next best thing? How do we streamline our operations? How do we make it easy? But how do we more importantly open the door mm -hmm. to everything? I think the reason why we don't do that as a culture is because A, like the price of failure for us is like, look, I'm all we got, so I can't fail, so I don't really wanna take that risk. But then it turns into a cultural thing where like if I'm a celebrity, my entourage isn't even equipped to like know who's for real when they come up to me in the club and want to talk business. So, you know, they equip probably to help you pull a baddie, but they ain't necessarily <laughs> equipped to be like, they oh, are bitches. you know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> this, this person. So we, that, like that lens isn't even on us. And then all of a sudden when we get like 40 or 50 and you're like Jay-Z or Nas, now you like, you start moving different. Now you want to brag about it and be like, but it's like, nigga, you was doing the same thing when you was 20. <laughs> but like what they do when they get their first 10 million in their 30s is immediately create a system. They call in their accountants. They call in their attorneys. I need to set up a trust. I want to set up my own venture capital fund. They call in their friends. How do we get deal flow immediately? It's not about like, look at me, look at me, look at me because I'm a millionaire. It's like until I got like 100, you, I ain't even talking about it. But it's just like, it's literally building a system. And it's also not wanting to be like famous and known because you the guy and you got a little bit or something. You know, like just build a system to reach back. And it, it won't even take you a lot of energy and effort if you build a system because you will have a secretary or whatever. So for everybody that's coming up to you and you're the celebrity, it's like, dang, man, I ain't got time. You already got a team of three people looking for the next best thing the irony about that is 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 the fact that there's the celebrities and then there's the people that cut the checks you know what i mean and i think that that's the part where they think because of the fame that it's going to get you to the cut the check part but the reality is with the distractions and all these things that are coming across it's almost impossible so it's I could see the whole low key. Hell yeah! Like yeah. remove me off Spokio. No, I mean, <laughs> okay. I, I'm not. I'm not about to be put out there. That's that's genius. That's pretty dope. Yeah. All right, but no, we 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 gotta wrap it up in a bit. But I got, I got yeah, two man. questions for you. So the first question is is what? So with you being so successful, attaining the level of success that you have, right? I know there are probably some hands out 
You know what I'm saying? The text messages, the DMs, like, cool, I know you got it, bro. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> I know you got it, my bro. Yeah, like, I, I, about this yeah, every day. like <laughs> I, I see you, right? So how are you, like, how do you, have you, like, kind of, like, developed a, like, filtration system? You know what I'm saying? Of who you actually going to help when it comes to, like, financial support to family and friends? Because I know it's important to you to probably share those experiences with the people you love, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But like like you said, everybody who said they fam, yeah. they fam. So what's your method? You know, it's tough. Like, I, w- I will say, like, so for any of my family watching, my family is great. My, my family literally don't ask me for shit. Like, <laughs> literally, they don't. <laughs> they don't. Uh, it'd be the people you just met, you know, or the people that kind of been around you, and then they might, you know, see a press article or something. And then they just start feeling comfortable. I mean, my biggest thing is like, I feel like I'm a giver naturally. Like I'm just always trying to connect people, help people, whatever. But my biggest thing is like, look, I'll give you a job, you know? I mean, that's still stressful because I I gotta figure out how to pay you, but I'll give you a job. But it's also like being able to like, help people be a part of something bigger than just the daily grind as well and like you might come around and meet new people learn something new and be inspired and it's like solving more than one problem right um so that's like one of the ways i kind of deal with that but i ain't gonna lie i definitely have my moments where i mean i think i'm 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 obviously it's, it's a blessing right but it's not always money it's just always something i mean i probably get like at least 10 requests every day from just a bunch of different people can i get this can i do that can you do this can you do that and like i'm normally pretty good with it but like maybe like once every three months you just have like one or two days where you just be exhausted like god damn (laughs) like (laughs) like because it's never like one specific person you know but it's like after that 100th request in the last like 10 days you just be ready to like snap out on somebody right but for the most part man it's it's a blessing like if i can help people like that's like just who i am as a person so it don't really it don't really bother me and, and i i will try to say like for the most part my my closest friends and family members like they help me as well with things that i could never do on my own and i help them and like i'm just happy to like I'm happy they look up to me to even even ask, you know? Like, like what's the point of even having shit if you don't share it with people, right? For sure. Yeah. For sure. And assemble, right? Yeah. Five years from now, what would you like to see that, like, develop into? Have you thought about that? Yeah, man. It's crazy. I mean, like, I think I want it to be a household brand for sure, and I just want people around the world, like, even you guys, like, it's, like, funny. Like, I want you to be able to go, dang, we got this podcast, like, you know what? I'm gonna call Elliot and B Dot tomorrow. Like the brand should be that strong that you can like call whoever look like you, that is like successfully doing what they're doing already to get mentorship and advice. But definitely across Europe, Africa, and the United States, North America, and uh, South America, and just a household name. Like just to be like you know specific. And no matter what you want to do, you should be able to see somebody in any sector that you can either learn from by watching a video course or you can like communicate with directly things happen for a reason you know what i mean like we i i truly believe that like you know you mentioned that and it's like it's it's ironic how you run into certain people um you know yourself and you know other other guests that we've had in the show that just are like-minded individuals and it's almost it's almost as like especially because we always like to have a conversation before we start our show and it's always like i mean it's not like it's premeditated but in some way it's like it relates to what we talk Mm -hmm. and and i think it's sometimes it's just the vibes that we throw or whatever but it's that's basically the the whole concept of our platform is is to bring that information you know what i mean and and not make it so niche um direction where where you're always going to talk about the same bullshit every day every day and then you know you're not learning anything but like here there's so many different stories and it, it's just a privilege to be able to have you on our show and and be so able to nervous, like man. you know definitely bring this knowledge cuz shit I learned a lot just hearing you talk because once again you know it's that additional extra that aha moment that you're like oh mm-hmm. shit yeah that's exactly what I was talking about like that's pretty dope yeah, most of 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know this has been an amazing episode, um, but we're coming to the end of our show. Um, like I do all the time, I open up the microphone, the table to our guests and to our co-hosts, our hosts. Um, we'll start out with you, Mr. Courtney. Is there anything you would like to share with our listeners and our viewers before we depart? I mean, you can follow us on social, assemble.be great. Um, we got some announcements coming probably in like the next two weeks. And uh, we've just been working hard. And just th thank you guys for like hitting me up and happy to support any kind of way now or you know tomorrow just let me know who i can connect you with and how how to help you like continue need, to build need, this need man a job, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> he said it no I, 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 let me get a job let you run the podcast you, you said it you said <laughs> it. i got my resume in the truck <laughs> i said it right <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Uh, gq nesso anything you would like to share I, you know the key i mean in my opinion is is growth you know uh pursue that that growth in your life and and definitely uh keep following us our on all on all our social uh social media platforms and just uh let us know you know we definitely appreciate you know your engagement and you know this is definitely useful information for everybody that's hearing this episode and um definitely um we're, we're definitely coming out with more too so all right most deaf and i would say this is uh a part of self-development is knowing your limitations. And once you recognize your limitations, you have to also uh, identify your resources available. All right, so you may not know everything or be able to reach everything or be able to attain everything, but there is a way to reach your goal. But that's all I gotta say. I'm your boy, Drew. We option for a podcast, we out. God bless. <laughs>